Factory. Today we'll be discussing probably one of my favorite wars in American history, right up there with the Boxer Rebellion. Let me know in the comments if I should do a video on that. The Spanish-American War. So if you've seen the Knowing Better video, A Veteran's Warning, I'll link it in the description if you haven't, you'll know about the ranking of the wars. He does this whole tier list, you know, the A-tier wars, the Civil War, and World War II that everyone's familiar with. Then there's like this B-tier wars, World War I, where people know about, but they don't really know the causes. He says that the Spanish-American War is kind of a mostly forgotten war, which is true. You learn about it in 10th grade history, and then maybe some discussions on Twitter or other social media about American imperialism, but it's mostly forgotten. And it's quite, I don't see why that is. I mean, we got two territories that are still part of the United States today, Puerto Rico and Guam. We, it's led to our unique relationship with Cuba and our unique relationship with the Philippines. But yes, so our story begins with the Spanish colonial empire. By 1898, the Spanish colonial empire was in decline, heavily declined. It went from having governments all throughout South America, as you can see by this GIF here, to having loyalist governments, to having fully independent governments, to essentially only controlling Cuba, the Dutch, sorry, the not Dutch West Indies, that would be St. Martin, the, uh, the Danish West Indies, which became Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, slash Guam, and Taiwan briefly until they sold it to the Japanese. I have Mr. Simon Bolivar here, you know, the liberator of Gran Colombia. Spain at this time, because of this decline of the Spanish Empire, was still pushing for a pan-Hispanic view, hoping that these nations in South America would still view themselves as at least part of a greater Spanish society. Domestically, Spain was also having problems. There had been three Carlist Wars, who were a faction of Spanish society who believed that the Carlist line of the Spanish royal family should be on the throne. They also became rejectors of liberal monarchy or constitutional monarchy. There was also hangovers in Spain from the Napoleonic era. There were Na Spain was in problems. <laughs> Fun fact, there was also a fourth Spanish uh, Carlist War, but that was sort of the Spanish Civil War. America also has a unique thing for the Caribbean. Uh, we have the Monroe Doctrine, you know, Europe, get out, no new colonies, and will not tolerate you trying to create any new colonies. U.S. Grant attempted to buy the Dominican Republic, and it failed in the Senate, the treaty. There was pushes from the Confederates to buy Cuba. Thomas Jefferson promoted the idea of buying Cuba. Uh, we were making progress with buying the Panama Canal from Gran Colombia at the time. Okay, so now we get to the thing that really started the war for the United States. Cuba was fighting for independence against the Spanish, and it in 1895, the Cuban War of Independence began. Before that, they had the Ten Years' War and the Little War. This gentleman here, I cannot remember his name. However, uh, he declared himself the first president of Cuba. There was a Spanish prime minister. I have his name here. Antonio Carlos de Castillo, who led Spain, who led Spain. Uh, Spain during this time, who was assassinated by anarchists, who was pushing for a hardline stance on a Spanish identity, and that would keep Cuba, would be a central theme of Spanish identity with the owning Cuba. He was later assassinated by anarchists, as I just said. If you'd like me to do a video on anarchists, leave, tell me about that in the description too. Spain also needed Cuba for trade purposes and military training, it taught jungle. However, the Cubans weren't getting a great deal out of this. They felt they were being treated, you know, as a poor colony, which they were. So they rose up. Many Americans actually really supported this. They linked, you know, they felt a lot of empathy. We rose up against a colonial empire, Britain. Uh, there's also the big discussion of yellow journalism with our friends William Randolph Hearst on the right there and Joseph Pulitzer in the center, even though there is some debates about how much yellow journalism actually affected people's mindsets. 
some people say it's the only reason you're in the war. Others argue that the war still probably would have happened without the two progressive New Yorkers deciding that we need to intervene. The United States actually pushed to negotiate. We appointed a new Spanish ambassador who said he'd be willing to negotiate a treaty and a peace between Spain and Cuba, which the Spanish rejected. So we plan to send a warship to Cuba to maintain some order. Foreshadowing. The Maine! The Maine was sent to Cuba to protect American and American interests in Cuba, as I just said. Uh, it was also there to make a point that something had to be done. The Maine was a pocket battleship, or it's known as a fast battleship, or at the time it was a heavy cruiser. It wasn't a full-scale battleship yet. The Dreadnought class hadn't been built, so it was not the biggest battleship, but we also at this time, uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Roosevelt was heavily pushing to have the Atlantic Fleet be sent to Key West in the event of war, and the Pacific Fleet be sent to Hong Kong to prepare to take on the Spanish possessions in the Pacific, just in case there was war. And then, boom. Remember the Maine. At 9.40 in the morning on February 15th, the Maine exploded, most likely because of someone smoking near the coal tender. Three-fourths of the ship's crew die, of the 355 sailors died. It was actually the single greatest loss of American military life since the Little Bighorn. They've actually sort of gone back and found out this was more of an accident. It wasn't an actual um, attack, but who knows? We do know. It's not, but for our purposes, we're going to pretend Spain attacked it. War! So the McKinley administration did not want to go to war. Many sort of thought, well, not yet. The Speaker of the House, Mr. Reed over there, who actually McKinley defeated at the 19, at the 1892 Republican Convention, thought that war was somewhat weak, that war was not worth, it wasn't worth it. Also, business interests didn't want the war, which is a shock to hear for once, but who knows? You know, times change. McKinley attempted to negotiate its way out, dampen things, but, well, you couldn't stop the tide. So, war happened because of these, or has helped because of these two men. On the left here, we have Redfield, We have Redfield Proctor, who was from Vermont, and he gave an impassioned speech. We gotta help Cuba. We gotta save them from the Spanish. And then Mr. Henry Teller over there to appease anti-imperialists as a Democrat and former Silver Republican made the argument that he proposed the Teller Amendment. By this way, Americans were already seizing ships and Spanish ships in American ports. The Teller Amendment made it so that Cuba would not become part of the United States, that, like, we couldn't annex it. But when it came to the vote of war, we chose war. So, let's start with the Pacific Theater. We're going to start with the Philippines. The Battle of Manila Bay. Dewey's Admiral Dewey, the famous Admiral Dewey, his ships arrived in Manila after being sailing from Hong Kong, their first attack was when they ran across two Spanish sea mines, but American ships spotted the Spanish fleets in Manila Harbor, formed a battle line, and began firing on the ships. They were led by the heavy cruiser USS Olympia, named after Olympia, Washington. The ship is still around, by the way. The Spanish, after seeing that their ships were being heavily bombarded and destroyed by the American cruisers and battleships, retreated and tried to re-enter the harbor. Americans continued shelling them. They were informed that they were running low on ammo. So, but they found that there was little damage to the American ships and to many it was seen as an American victory. How we, lost, we didn't lose too many ships. We shelled the soar. We beat the Spanish Navy. Here are some great pictures. These are Spanish Marines firing on the American Marines attempting a beach landing during the Battle of Manila Bay. This is another great painting. 
the American ships destroying the Spanish ships in the harbor. Now the Battle of Manila. This was uh, at the same time, by the way, as the American invasion of the Philippines. There was a Filipino revolution to establish a home rule Filipino Republic, which we allied with them only to then betray them and establish the American protectorate in the Philippines, which is really quite sad. Uh, but we have the American commanders here. There's Admiral Dewey. There's the Filipino leaders, first president of the Philippines, head of the Filipino army. There's the head of the American forces there. And this gentleman here became the, fa is, became the father of General Douglas MacArthur, who also had his own Battle of Manila. The Battle of the Second Battle of Manila during the Spanish Civil War was what some people call a mock battle, as it happened after the peace treaty, with little with minimal loss of life, which happened with minimal loss of life, and it was signed after it happened after the peace treaty. That's why it's called a mock battle. Essentially, we had taken the Philippines. Guam was also another quite hilarious one. Our naval ships arrived and the Spanish garrison surrendered, surrendering the entire island of Guam to the United States. The Cuban theater. This is what most Americans are familiar with when we talk about the Spanish-American War. Guantanamo Bay, which, yes, is the same Guantanamo Bay where the prison in which Americans tortured people. <laughs> we, blockaded the, we blockaded Guantanamo Bay with our naval ships and fired upon the shore, the Marines attempted a landing. This is where our Marine Corps got extremely famous. Uh, the Spanish had better rifles, the quick-firing Spanish Mauser, than the Americans. However, the tide of battle was turned when the Americans brought out their machine guns. And yes, we did have machine guns in 1895. They were known as, it was the Model 1895 Colt Browning, also known as the Potato Digger. We were able to secure the village and secure the Spanish military camps surrounding there, thus taking the battle and winning our one of our first victories in the Spanish-American War Cuban theater. I am not going to try announce, pronouncing this because my Spanish is really bad, but if I'll go for it. Las Canamas. Another, this was another American victory over the Spanish. This battle featured a one Colonel Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. It was a heavy jungle conflict. Teddy's troops were sent on scouting duty when they ran across a Spanish camp. They fired upon it, shelled it. The, Amer the Spanish garrison fell after once again heavily shelling by General Young, and the Spanish opened the pathway to Santiago de Cuba, which is the second largest city in Cuba and a major port. This is the one that probably most Americans know, the Battle of San Juan Hill. Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders once again charged up the hill after a scouting mission to destroy the Spanish outposts there. Uh, most people know the story. If not, it's a great read on Wikipedia if you get bored. But one little thing that's important to remember is that one of the reasons victory was so easy in the Battle of San Juan Hill was that we heavily outnumbered the Spanish. And they were poorly supplied in, by that point. El Cani was a uh, mixed result, though we did technically win and claimed victory. We took heavy losses to take what was a small uh, outpost of the Spanish. Uh, General Henry Layton there was sort of rumored to be an alcoholic, and that was affecting his judgment, but this is, you know, later knowledge that has come out. Uh, the Battle of Santiago de Cuba was a massive naval victory in outside of Spain, outside of the city that allowed us to finally lay siege to the city, but we're not there yet. These are some Spanish victories. There is the ba Battle of Menema, a small skirmish in the eastern part of Cuba where we attempted a landing with Marines, the Battle of Aguadores, which was a small city that the Spanish repelled us was, and the Battle of Tacuba, which once again, we were repelled from a city. The siege of Santiago, which probably Santiago, which probably brought an end to the Spanish-American War, at least in Cuba, was a massive American assault versus massive Spanish assault, and the Spanish failed to push back the Americans. The Spanish surrendered, and with it, most of Cuba. The Puerto Rican theater, or Puerto Rican. Uh, the green, the blue line 
in over this picture is the Spanish is the American naval fleets route around the uh, Puerto Rico. This is the Spanish governor general. That's the slave Spanish flag of Spanish Puerto Rico there. The blue yellow are by the end of the war municipalities controlled by Spain. The blue are municipalities controlled by the United States. So there are some major sea battles such as the shelling of San Juan, Puerto Rico, such as this one right here by American forces. There was battles in the seas around Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico actually had some heavy, very heavy fighting on it. Uh, we invaded Puerto Rico. These are Spanish troops entrenched there. These are Spanish and Puerto Rican prisoners of war. This is pr uh, shelling providing cover for American troops landing on Puerto Rico. And this picture here is the Wisconsin Infantry Regiment. This is a famous lighthouse overlooking San Juan in which there is American landing at. And finally, peace at last. With Spanish suffering heavy losses until the fall of Cuba to the United States, the Treaty of Paris was signed, which gave America control of the Spanish Philippines, the Carolinas. Oh, we, we also at this point had invaded Hawaii, so we annexed Hawaii. We had Guam. Now we had Puerto Rico and also Cuba. This caused some reactions. Uh, Spain, some argue that the, with the shellacking Spanish took in the Spanish Civil War is what caused them to remain neutral in the First World War. This created also the Spanish-American War Veterans Society, which later evolved into the Veterans of Foreign Wars. It became a big issue in the 1900 presidential campaign with Roosevelt's administration, with the McKinley administration arguing, hey, we won the wars, we got fixed the recession that was happening, all is well. We also noticed that Mr. Teddy Roosevelt, by this one, had been nominated for to be the Republican vice president. Brian was in a rematch running against a, running on a plan of what if we just, you know, relax, not have imperialism, not have an empire, have liberty. Uh, but actually, a lot of Americans kind of liked having an empire. McKinley won this election on a landslide. So anyways, thanks for watching. This is our little picture of the, of the cruiser Olympia. I hope to see you in my next video. Bye!